So our next speaker will be Anton Lorenzen. Uh, yeah, thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Oh, well, if the video works. Okay. It does. Okay, cool. So yeah, thanks so much. So if you feel like uh, your camel is a bit, your old camel is a bit rusty, <laughs> maybe it's not you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, so I'm Anton Lorenzen, and I'm presenting work on oxidizing our camel with modal memory management. And this is joint work with my co-authors, Leo White, Stephen Dolan, Richard Eisenberg from Jane Street, and Sam Lindley from Edinburgh. And this project actually was started at Jane Street, and parts of it are already used in production. And uh, you can talk to a lot of Jane Street people here if you want to know more about how this works in practice. So what is this whole oxidizing our camel business? The idea is that you can kind of think of a scale where you have OCaml on the one hand, where you have only garbage collection, and on the other side you have Rust, where you have only manual memory management. And the idea is we want to move OCaml a little bit in the direction of Rust, like not all the way, but we want to get some capabilities for manual memory management while preserving the spread of the language, which means it should, it should be opt-in. All existing OCaml code should continue to work. And it should have strong type inference so that it's really ergonomic to use. And the reason we want to do this is that we want to be able to write low latency code. So of course, if you do some manual memory management, this will improve performance. But it also gives you like a qualitatively different programming experience. Because currently, it is quite tricky to write low latency code in OCaml. Um, because every time you do an allocation, this allocation will advance the minor GC pointer. And that can um, trigger a garbage collection cycle which can cause a pause. So to give you one example for this, let's, do, let's implement like a really uh, simple function. We get some data, which is like some bunch of integers, and we want to add one integer to each of them without having latencies. And so the first implementation we could do is that we uh, use just list.map. So our data is a list of integers. But the problem is that the, that lists in, in OCaml are immutable. That means the list map function needs to allocate a whole new list. And that can cross GC pauses. So OK, this doesn't work. Let's use an array instead. So we'll map in place over an array where our, our data is now stored in the array. And of course, because the array is mapped in place, we don't need to allocate a new array. The problem, though, is that this is still not free from allocations. Because there's one allocation hidden in plain sight, the closure itself would need to be allocated. So what we want to do in this work is that we want the ability to allocate the closure on the stack and maybe even update the list in place so that we could even write the more functional version. So let's look at the first challenge. How can we do stack allocation in OCaml? So the way stack allocation works is that broadly you have like these two things in your program image. You have the heap, which is like where most of your data lives. And then you have the stack where you have one frame for each function call. And the garbage collector kind of wants you to have two different kinds of pointers that are allowed. So you can point from the stack into the heap, and you can point from a stack frame into an earlier stack frame. But you cannot have pointers going the other way. So you cannot have a pointer going onto the stack, because the stack frame might shrink at some point, and then this would be a, become a dangling pointer. And equally, you cannot have a pointer from an earlier stack frame to a later one. And the way we want to enforce kind of these, uh, that the pointers should go this way um, we will introduce something that we call a mode for locality. So let's say we want to have this function f, um, x is mapped to x, x plus n, and we want to have this allocated on the stack. We need to ensure that there's no pointers coming from the heap to this value. And we do this by giving it this mode at local, which kind of sits alongside the type and describes a restriction on this value. So a local value may live on the current stack frame, and the restriction we have alongside this is that a local value cannot escape the current region. Uh, the opposite of local is global, so something that does not have this restriction and can live on the heap would be global. Now, what can we do with this local value? One thing we might want to do is that we return a local value from the current function. But this is pretty unsafe, right? Because we've allocated this closure on the current stack frame. We pop off the stack frame, returning a pointer to the closure, which no longer exists, so we have a dangling pointer. So this is not allowed. What we can do, however, is that we just call the function. So we can apply it to some argument. And we can also pass it on. So if we have uh, a function like map, 
that has maybe been annotated with a local annotation, meaning that any, any closure you pass to it will not be returned or otherwise escape, then we can pass our current local closure f to this function. So it's kind of downward closed in this sense. And another thing we might want to do is that we maybe put f into some kind of box. And so I said the box is maybe global, so it lives on the heap. But this is, again, a pointer going from the heap into the stack. So this is not allowed. It is, however, allowed if the box itself is local and also lives on the stack, because then we have a pointer from a more recent stack allocation to an earlier stack allocation. And this actually allows us to you know, stack allocate the function. And we could write the array.map in place uh, function actually uh, without having allocations on the heap. Now, how do we do the list map example? So the thing we want to achieve is that we can write a map function where every time we create a new con cell, we can override the con cell that we have already. So kind of as we map over the list, we change the things uh, as we go along. So if we, for example, map the identity function over like a list one, two, three, you just go through it and just like reuse the same memory for this allocation. Of course, in order to make this safe, we don't want to overwrite immutable data that's used somewhere else. So we need a separate thing, a separate mode for uniqueness. And we say a unique value has only one reference to it. So let's say I have a list uh, xs, one, two, three. Uh, because I've just now created it, it will be unique. I have the only reference to it. And I can mark this using this mode. Now, what can I do with xs? One thing I might, might want to do is that I like project something out, and this is always possible. You can project out of a unique data structure and get a unique thing back. Um, but if I do this twice, then of course this is not allowed because what I've now done is that I've created two pointer to two, three, four. So I have now two different uh, references to the same data structure that was supposed to be unique. And similarly, I could not create two consults that have the same tail because then what the memory looks like is, of course, the consults are unique, but then kind of going one step further, this uniqueness property is not maintained. So it should really, uniqueness should really be a deep property that applies to all of the elements of the data structure. And this allows us to do the override, because if I have the only reference to something, then there can be no other kind of thread or other location in the code that could observe me mutating this thing. So this makes overwriting safe. And actually, this uniqueness mode works really well with, with uh, the local mode, because it gives us a notion of borrowing. So let's say I have some data, like this list one, two, three. And before I map over it, I want to apply some kind of function to it, like the length function here. Then I can actually do this. Because what happens here is that I have, I create data and the, the, the data list, and that is unique. Then I apply the length function to it. But the length function promises to take its argument local, which in this case means that this list cannot escape. So I've created a bunch of aliases to this data structure. It is no longer unique. But I know that at a certain point, um, like, the, like this, this local thing cannot escape. And so at that point, these local aliases need to stop, and I get a unique thing back. So this gives you a way to do borrowing using just these two modes. So Together, this now enables us to write latency free, oh, low latency code in, in OCaml. So let's say I take the map function, and I'll now annotate the closure I give to it as local, meaning this closure will not escape and can be allocated on the stack. And the input list should be unique. And then I can implement the shift by function on a unique list, where I just call list.map, and the closure will be allocated on the stack. Um, and the, the kind of list will be overwritten in place. So this causes no allocations. So this is very good, and uh, it would be nice maybe to end the talk here, but I cannot because there is a small problem still. And this problem will occur as soon as you put unique data into a closure. So let's say I write the following program. I have some data, one, two, three, which is a unique list. And I now create this function foo that is a closure that closes over the unique data element. And now I can apply foo to one. So this shifts all of the elements of my data by one. So I have now the list two, three, four. But now I can do this again. And I see that I get three, four, five 
as the second result, but also as the first result. Because data is the same list, and I'm overwriting the same list every time I invoke the closure. So clearly, this is not really feasible. Um, what can we do to fix this? The idea is we need another mode to say things that can only be used once. So if you have a closure that closes over a unique value, you're only allowed to invoke it once. And this, we have this once mode to do this. So if you try to invoke it twice now, you get a compile time error. And this mode is called affinity. So an affine value can be used at most once, and its opposite is many. So let's say I have some list, xs, which I can only use once. What can I do with it? Well, I can still project out of it. This is fine. But I cannot forget that this thing is once. Right? I cannot say, suddenly I have, I have a once value, and like part of it I can use many times. This is not allowed, because really once is a restriction. And I can also, of course, not create two aliases of it, because then I would have like two aliases that I can only use once, meaning the user might use it twice in the end. So this is not allowed. So affinity and uniqueness seem kind of related, if you've seen these slides. Um, and there's actually a very nice way to relate these two. So uniqueness is kind of um, a permission you have. You know that the value has only one reference, and this is a property you can forget. And in contrast, an affine value is a restriction. So this is a, a restriction that you can assume, but you cannot go the other way around. So one way to think about this is like, let's say you have a value at this mode at the present time. A unique value has not been aliased in the past, so you have the only reference to it. But there's no restriction on what you'll do with it in the future. It might end up being used more than once later. Um, if you have an affine value, it may have well you, there may have well been aliases to this value in the past, but you're no longer allowed to create new aliases in the future. So they are kind of very nicely dual to each other. And it turns out that this view is quite helpful, especially if you want to write a good type inference for this, because this forget unique and assume affine function kind of can work as like a, like a coercion that your type inference inserts. And the way this works is that we have the submoding system that allows that where we can find out what mode a value should be at. So let's say I wrote this function foo here that takes a Boolean and some, some list, and it shifts the list by one in the first branch, and it creates an alias to the list in the second. Now, in many linear type systems, this would not be allowed. You have to decide, do you want a unique reference that you can update in place, or do you want to uh, have the ability to create an alias? But actually, here you can do both. And the way we do this is that we create kind of these small um, variables or like, um, at each of the occurrences of the value list. And then we, then we, on the side, record some inequalities that we know. So if, um, if, uh, if one of the uses of list should be unique, then also the parameter we get should be unique. And we can kind of record this. But also in the second branch, we see, oh, really, here list should be aliased. And if we look at kind of this system of inequalities, we find an assignment where we can say, oh, we get a unique parameter and we use it uniquely, but in the second branch, we have two alias uses, and this is all good. However, if we were to break this, for example, by also trying to shift the list in the second branch alongside the creation of an alias, what we would get is kind of this uh, a cycle where we can see that unique is smaller equal to three, or, or bigger equal to three, and three is bigger equal to alias, so alias needs to be bigger equal unique, but on the side we've said unique should be smaller than alias. So this would be a contradiction. And of course, this is not allowed to override something while you create an alias to the old version. And we can use a very similar trick to also type closures. So if we go back to this foo example I had, the idea is now that we kind of relate the mode of the closure to the mode of the free variables in this closure by kind of this extra relation we have. And in the type checker, we do this by putting a lock into the context. And kind of whenever you use a, a free variable in a closure, it has to kind of go through this lock and we'll add this inequality in our submoding solver. Uh, yes. Thank you for your attention. Um, all of this is, as I said, partially in production already, so especially the stack allocation bit. And you can visit the Jane Street table for a demonstration of this work. Thank you.
questions? Hi there, I'm Federico Pizzuti from uh, Huawei Research and, UK and Development UK. Okay. I have a question about the system which is very elegant. I like it a lot. But can you return borrows? Can I take a borrowed complex structure, index into it, and return a borrow? Because that's where the I find the real complexity comes from, and not having that is kind of a big deal, <laughs> I think. Yes. So um, the idea with our locals is that they cannot escape the region. And one way, like a very simple way to think about region is th like the scope. And then you could not return a borrow, but you can also place the region in a smarter way. And then you can kind of replace it. You can return a local out of a function, but it still cannot escape the surrounding region, which is a bit more coarse grained than what you were maybe thinking. OK, well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Arno Galfuz from the LMF Lab. Uh, lab. Um, I was wondering, if you take a polymorphic function that mm -hmm. takes an alpha, uh, does the formula of polymorphism also apply to modes? Why do you mm. polymorphize over modes? Yes. So at the moment, it does not in our work. Um, but we hope to add this in the future. OK. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, th this looks very nice. Um, I was wondering a little bit about local. So that seems like fairly cross-grained, although you have these constraints that you can nest them in one direction, and or, but not in the other, which I imagine works by construction for immutable values. But what if you have like a mutable cell with a local content? How do you track that? Don't you need like explicit regions distinguished between local regions at that point? Uh, yeah, so at the moment, we have the restriction that you can only put global values into mutable cells. Ah. Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, let's uh, thank the speaker. Then.